I walked into my own home, expecting to surprise my wife on her birthday. Instead, I found her in bed with my best friend. The shock hit me like a punch to the gut. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't think. But I knew one thing. I wouldn't let them get away with it. As they slept, I snapped pictures. Proof of their betrayal. My heart hardened as I realized the cruel plan forming in my mind. They thought they could destroy me, but they underestimated the depth of my revenge. This isn't over. It's just beginning. It was meant to be a surprise for her. In some ways, it was, but it became a surprise for me instead. Honestly, I can say it wasn't how either of us wanted to celebrate her 30th birthday. You hear stories about things like this happening. You read them and think, that's awful, but you never expect it to happen to you. You don't think your whole world will change in an instant, leaving you with a deep emptiness where your heart used to be. The stories usually focus on older men, like retired soldiers, police officers, lawyers, or people who work long hours. It's never about someone like me, just a regular IT guy who spends his time working and playing games on weekends. You don't think this could happen to someone like me. Yet it did. As I stood in the doorway of our bedroom, seeing her with someone else, it felt like everything I knew was falling apart. I had left work early that day to surprise her. That morning I had wished her a happy birthday with warm gestures and breakfast in bed. She seemed a bit down, but I thought it was just because she was tired. After all, who wouldn't appreciate breakfast in bed? We exchanged I love yous, and I headed to work, excited because she had no idea I was coming home early for a nice lunch at her favorite restaurant. She had said she was taking a few days off for her birthday, and I had asked her what her plans were. She told me she just wanted to relax and maybe watch some shows. I asked if she wanted to go out with friends later, and she said yes. She was always ready for a fun night out, relaxing at home, watching shows. I should have paid more attention to that. Maybe it was just a slip of the tongue, but I was so trusting that I didn't think much of it. I had hinted that there might be a surprise later. I didn't want her to guess I was coming home early, taking her to her favorite place, and that I had a special gift for her hidden away. If she had known any of that, especially about me coming home early, I might not have been the one left so shocked. How could I have seen it coming? As I stood in the doorway of our bedroom, I noticed the sunlight shining on her face. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. How could I have thought everything was fine? There were no signs that anything was wrong. Yet the same warm light that illuminated the woman I loved also revealed her friend beside her. Gwen was usually comfortable in her own space and often enjoyed her time relaxed at home. She had a small, delicate figure and her skin glowed softly under the light. She wasn't a glamorous model, but she had her own unique beauty that I loved. However, it was her eyes that drew me in the most. They were big and dark, and I could lose myself in them for hours. But Joe, I had never seen him like that before, and honestly, I didn't want to again. He was shorter than me, about 5'9", and we were both of average build. Joe Eisenberger was an old friend and even stood up for us at our wedding. Just an average guy, an average guy sharing my wife's bed. The air was heavy with unspoken emotions, one I didn't want to be a part of. Gwen and Joe lay sleeping, the sheets a messy jumble around them. Her long hair was tousled, and it looked like his was a complete mess. They lay close to each other, as if seeking warmth despite the summer heat. Gwen's small frame was curled against Joe's, his arm resting protectively around her. I stood there, trying to understand how my wife, the woman I loved, who promised to be mine alone, was there with someone I never thought would be involved in this way. I felt sick. No matter how many times I closed my eyes and tried to shake the image, it was always right there when I opened them again. I went numb. In an instant, I felt nothing at all. My body felt stiff as I took my phone out and snapped a few pictures of the two of them together. Then I quietly closed the bedroom door and walked away. I needed a drink, maybe a smoke too. I hadn't smoked in years, but at that moment I craved it. Gwen still had a pack of clove cigarettes in her purse from her goth days. I found it, took a beer from the fridge, and sank into the recliner. The beer was cold, and the clove cigarette had a strong yet sweet taste. Between sips and puffs, I glanced at the photos on my phone, 
confronting the reality of betrayal. Seeing it on the small screen instead of right in front of me didn't make the shock any easier. The numb feeling started to change into a deep ache in my stomach. What was I going to do? That was one question. Why she had done it was another. How long? That thought weighed on me, too. And why Joe? Were there others? Oh, no, I didn't want to think about that. Each question made my stomach turn. The emptiness in my chest grew worse as I sat there lost in thought. They were both deep in sleep. They hadn't noticed when I got home to a quiet house and they continued to sleep, unaware of me standing in the doorway. As far as I knew, they were still sleeping while I sat in my chair, feeling waves of sadness wash over me. It felt like a tide pulling me deeper into a dark sea of despair. I must have sat there for almost 20 minutes, nursing a cigarette and a beer until a troubling thought crossed my mind. With a swipe of my thumb, I closed the photo app and opened the text message app. I drew on my cigarette again and paused to solidify my plan before acting on it. My thumb flew over the small screen before I pressed send to Gwen. Jack, hey love, left work early, home in 20, go out or stay in. I waited. 10 seconds, 30 seconds. In the bedroom, I heard Gwen's phone go off. She always turned the volume up high so she wouldn't miss any important messages. Before long, I heard the hurried sounds of two people moving around in the bedroom. The bedroom door opened, and I caught a quick glimpse of Joe as he hurried down the hallway to the bathroom. He didn't see me sitting in the living room. That was good. I had more time to think about what was happening. My phone vibrated. Gwen had replied, Gwen, yay, stop and get wine. I glanced toward the kitchen where a bottle of Merlot sat on the table. I almost laughed out loud. She was trying to buy time to get her guest out and tidy up. Jack. Merlot, okay, Gwen? Perfect. See you soon, Jack. I love you, Gwen. She didn't reply. Her silence stung, adding to the hurt that was already growing. I could hear more movement coming from the bedroom. I picked up the beer to calm my racing heart, even if it didn't help with the knot in my stomach. I started on my second cigarette when I heard the toilet flush and the bathroom door open again. Joe was coming back. I watched the time. I waited until he was almost past the doorway that led from the living room to the hallway before softly calling out, Hey, Joe, how are you doing? I sounded surprisingly calm, I thought. But the look on his face as he stepped back to see the living room was unforgettable. It was pure shock, and I wished I could hold on to that moment forever. So I raised my phone and took another picture, capturing Joe in all his surprise with a look that was hard to describe. Jack, he began. What? I placed a finger to my lips and shook my head. I didn't want to give anything away just yet. Was I being unkind? Maybe, but I didn't care. With a quick gesture, I opened the text app. I sent two short messages to Gwen's phone. Jack. Gwen, honey? Then I sent the second message, which had the picture of her and Joe together. Jack. I'm home. Turning back to Joe, I raised an eyebrow and asked casually, So how long? He didn't answer right away still trying to process that he'd been caught. What he finally managed to say in the moments before Gwen appeared was, a while. Then Gwen came out of the bedroom, bursting through the door and rushing down the hallway to stand next to Joe. She held her phone tightly in one hand. She had at least managed to put on a green robe that I had given her two Christmases ago. It revealed a lot, but also showed her youthful beauty. However, her expression was filled with fear. Her lips quivered and her eyes were wider than I had ever seen them. I couldn't believe it. I was the one who had been betrayed. Why did it hurt so much to see her like this? A heavy silence settled between the three of us for a few seconds before I pointed toward the kitchen. The wine's on the table, I said quietly. Sorry, I didn't have time to chill it. Jack, I, I cut her off. You were with Joe, in our home, behind my back, and it's been going on for a while. Is that what you were going to say? I pushed the last part of my cigarette into the ashtray with more force than necessary. Give me one reason, Gwen, why I shouldn't share those photos with everyone we know, your family included. Because I love you. Wow, my wife knew me too well. She knew exactly what to say, and that only added to the anger and embarrassment I felt inside. But I wasn't going to give in that easily. You care about me deeply, yet here you are. Well, I'm glad to know that you care about me, Gwen. I can only imagine what you might do if you didn't. 
Gwen didn't say anything. She just pulled her robe tighter around herself and looked down at her feet. I glanced at her boyfriend. I wasn't in the mood to deal with him, especially when he was being careless. Joe, grab your things and leave. He tried to act brave. With a worried look at Gwen, he mumbled, Jack, I know this looks bad and you two need to talk, but maybe I shouldn't go right now. That's when I lost it. I don't remember getting up. One moment I was sitting, and the next I was right in front of Joe telling him to leave. I don't recall what I said. My words came out in a rush. I was shaking all over, feeling like my skin was on fire and my hands were balled into fists at my sides. The urge to lash out was almost overwhelming. I'm not someone who fights. I've only been in three confrontations in my life, two in middle school and one in high school. I usually keep my cool and only raise my voice when necessary. I hadn't tried to hurt anyone, but that day was different. I was furious. If Joe had said one more word or made a move, I felt I could have acted in anger. That's probably why both Joe and Gwen looked so scared. They had never seen me like this. No one had. Whatever I said must have hit hard. Joe stepped back quickly and ran off to the bedroom. Gwen looked pale. She took several steps back, putting space between us. That stung. In our time together, I had never raised my voice at her. When we did argue, it was always with control. I knew about the troubles she faced before we met, and I would never want to act like those who hurt her. Did I seem like someone who could hurt her? She tried to speak again while I stood there, still upset. Jack, I'm so sorry. This wasn't how it was supposed to go. It was just a misunderstanding. I don't care about him more than I do about you. We just, we had an agreement, that's all. As the anger faded, I felt a tremor in my body. I stared blankly at the wall while Joe hurried to collect his things. And when were you going to tell me about this so-called agreement, Gwen? When were you going to tell me that you were being disloyal? I hated how shaky my voice was. I refused to cry. No way was I going to cry in front of her, and I certainly wasn't going to show her any sympathy. I'm not okay when it feels like I'm in so much pain. The hurt must have shown on my face. My wife, Gwen, moved closer, reaching out to comfort me. The look of understanding on her face made me feel even worse. It just added to my shame. I pushed her hand away. No! Don't touch me right now, Gwen. Just don't! I could see tears in her eyes as she stepped back. My own eyes were starting to sting, and it was hard for me to hold back my emotions. I refused to show her how I felt. I would not show weakness. I had already been betrayed by someone I thought I could trust completely, and I wasn't going to let anyone trick me again. I couldn't believe what Gwen said anymore. Jack, she pleaded softly, please listen to me. I'm sorry. I never meant to hurt you. Joe walked in, looking worried and in a bit of a mess. He cautiously walked past us into the living room, trying to avoid my gaze. He looked at Gwen and swallowed hard. Gwen, I'll talk to you later. Then he glanced at me and said, You should really listen to her, Jack. Gwen cares about you. Don't do something you'll regret. Like being with my friend's wife, Joe? Like betraying him and making him look foolish? Is that what you mean? I shook my head. Get out. Leave. He didn't say anything else. I was left alone with my wife. For what felt like ages, we stood in silence. She looked upset and scared, but could I really trust that? If she had deceived me about our marriage, how could I believe anything she said? My mind was racing with questions I couldn't voice. Joe wanted me to hear Gwen out. She claimed she didn't love him more than me. Did that mean she still had feelings for him? I wasn't sure I wanted to know. It's my choice, she suddenly said. I blinked at her in surprise, but she held her head high and met my gaze. It's my choice, she repeated firmly, and being married doesn't mean you get to control what I do. That made me think for a moment. You're right, Gwen. I don't have the right to control you. You're not my possession. You are your own person, able to make your own choices. I pointed toward her, trying to express my feelings about her freedom. You wanted to get a new piercing. I wasn't sure about it at first, but I didn't stop you. I even ended up liking it. You decided we would use protection to avoid having kids. We talked about what we would do if that happened, and I agreed because it's your body, your health. But I am your husband, I exclaimed, my calm voice breaking. I felt sick to my stomach. My hands shook as I spoke. You promised me. In front of my sister, your mother, our friends, and the minister, do you remember what you promised? Love, honor, comfort, did you mean any of that? 
I did. I do. But it's not that simple, Jack. I needed more. I tried to be true to you. I really did. Please, I'm sorry. I didn't want you to find out like this. It hurt me deeply, like a slap across the face. Communication is more than just words. It's about how and when they are said. Her words about trying rang alarms in my mind. You've been with him since before we got married. Since before I met you, she admitted quietly, looking away from me. We've been married for six years and dated for a bit over two, which meant she'd known Joe for almost a decade. Joe and I have been close for a long time, Jack. There's something between us that's hard to explain. We can't imagine life without each other. Her eyes looked at me with a mix of love and concern. But you were the one I wanted to marry, Jack. You are my choice. Please, believe me. I pulled out the small necklace case from my pocket and threw it to the ground between us, where it popped open and revealed the beautiful choker I had bought her. The sunlight made the gems shine. Happy birthday, Gwen. Time felt strange. I remember her begging me not to go. I can hear her voice, but not the words, and I don't recall her face at all. I can't remember leaving either. I remember her sobbing on the porch while I sat in my car, avoiding looking at her. Then I was just driving away. I was lucky not to have an accident. I snapped back to reality while driving on the highway, unsure of where I was or which way I was going. Some part of me needed to escape, so I drove away without knowing where I was going. When I finally felt steady, I pulled into a small rest stop. There were no gas stations or stores, just a plain brick building with bathrooms and vending machines. I stepped out and walked to a grassy area with picnic benches. As I reached the trees, I felt really unwell and got sick in the bushes. It felt like everything inside me was empty, both physically and emotionally. I leaned against a nearby tree to catch my breath. My skin felt cold and sweaty. My throat hurt, and I wanted everything around me to disappear. Hey there, a voice called out. I opened my eyes to see an older truck driver walking toward me. Are you all right? I nodded and let my hands rest in my lap. Yeah, I guess. But I was not being honest. Actually, no, I'm not. He squatted close to me, looking into my eyes. He looked like your typical truck driver, overweight, rough, wearing a faded baseball hat. I don't smell alcohol on you and your eyes don't look messed up, so it seems you're not on drugs. But you look really bad. Are you sick? Do you want me to call for help? I shook my head and managed a small smile. No, I mean sort of. Just heartbroken, you know? The stranger nodded knowingly. Yeah, I get that. Sorry to hear it. He glanced back toward the highway, then focused on me again. You were swerving a lot on the road. I pulled in after you to check on you, but you're already looking pretty rough. You shouldn't drive again. Do you have someone you can call? There had been two people I trusted more than anyone. Now there was only one. Yeah, my sister. I can call her. With shaky fingers, I took out my phone. The truck driver stepped back a bit to give me some privacy, but stayed close enough to watch over me, which I appreciated. The phone rang twice before my sister Annabelle answered. Hearing her familiar voice was a relief. Hey, you, what's up? I thought you were going to hang out with Gwen today. I smiled. Hey, things didn't really go as planned. That was putting it lightly. Can you come pick me up? Also, can I stay at your house tonight? Just for one night, I promise. Annabelle went quiet. Anyone who knows her realizes that when she goes quiet, it usually means trouble. What happened? I took a deep breath and let my smile fade. I saw Gwen and Joe, together, not long ago. There was a long, chilly pause before she exclaimed, That's terrible! Then Annabelle shifted into action mode. Where are you? I felt a bit silly asking the truck driver for our location, but he was kind about it. I told my sister where we were, hearing her make notes on the other end. All right, I'll drop the kids off at my brother-in-law's house. Tammy and I watch each other's kids often. Just give me about 20 or 30 minutes and I'll be there. Annabelle's voice softened as she added, I'm so sorry, big brother. It's okay, I said, trying to sound lighthearted. Not your fault. See you soon. Love you. Love you too, Jack. She must have been worried. We rarely used each other's names unless things were serious. The call ended, and I looked up at the truck driver. He shifted closer to me and squatted down again. Sorry, I didn't mean to listen, but I heard enough. She cheated on you, huh? I couldn't speak, so I nodded. 
He clicked his tongue, looking upset. My wife left me a while back for someone younger. It's tough. He raised an eyebrow. Do you have kids? I shook my head. No, we were planning to, but honestly, that might make things easier. I don't think my daughter forgave either of us. He took out an old leather wallet and pulled out a worn business card. You probably don't know what to do right now. I didn't either back then. But if you need help, call this guy. He really helped me. I took the card and looked at it. Thomas Lynn, who is he? A divorce lawyer, a good one. Nice guy. We still grab a drink sometimes. Maybe things will work out for you, maybe not. But it won't hurt to call him. He'll be straightforward with you. He stretched out his hand and introduced himself. Ted, Ted White. I shook his hand, appreciating its firmness. I felt a bit embarrassed that my hand was sweaty. I liked this guy. Jack Brandt. I need to hit the road, Jack. You'll wait for your sister? Yeah, driving right now doesn't seem safe. Sounds good. Take care of yourself, Jack. Things seem rough now, but they usually find a way to get better. At least that's what I've been told. Ted left, and I closed my eyes again. Leaning back against the tree, I tried to relax. Nothing about life felt clear anymore. The person I trusted most had let me down while a stranger had shown me kindness. Everything felt upside down. For a brief moment, I lost track of everything. The sounds of the busy road faded away and I started to remember, are you alone? I looked up from my drink, surprised to see a small girl in a dark outfit smiling at me. It was unexpected that she would talk to me, especially since I looked nothing like the people around us. My friends and I were nerds who had just finished college. We loved playing tabletop games, discussing sci-fi and fantasy, exchanging comic books, and joining card game tournaments. A few of us liked reenacting historical events, too. We spent most of our time in coffee shops and libraries, enjoying all kinds of music, as long as it was varied and interesting. So how did we end up in a club where goths and the early emo crowd hung out? Someone thought it would be fun to try something new. There were laughs about pretending to be vampires at our gaming sessions, so we thought, why not go meet some? We just wanted to experience something different without making fun of anyone. Everyone else dressed up in dark leather and netting. It was amusing to see some of the guys trying out makeup, hoping to look cool instead of silly. Thankfully, we found helpful tutorials online. A trip to the mall got us some spiked accessories that added to our looks. We probably looked all right, but who knows what the actual goths thought of us. I didn't dress up like my friends. I skipped the makeup, too. My budget was tight, so I made do with what I could find at a thrift store. Slightly worn black jeans, a stained white t-shirt with a skull graphic, a dark red and gray checkered shirt, and my old sneakers. Back then, my light brown hair was long, reaching my waist, tied back with a few hair bands. Did I look goth? Probably not. I was more like a skinny guy who just stumbled in from the woods than an elegant figure of the night. I sat at the bar, sipping on my first drink while my friends wandered off to explore the darker areas of the club. Even though no one made me feel unwelcome, I felt out of place. So when this small, pixie-faced girl wearing a beautiful black dress approached me, I was confused. But my heart raced at the sight of her. She had a captivating scent that reminded me of both flowers and spices. And her eyes. I could have looked anywhere, but I found myself just wanting to focus on her. I couldn't help but stare into her big, dark eyes framed by long lashes. Are you alone? She asked again, louder this time when I didn't answer. The loud music made it hard to talk normally, but she kept smiling. Um, no, no, I stammered. I'm with some friends. I think they're dancing over there. But are you alone? She insisted. I was surprised by her question and quickly shook my head. You mean, no, no, I'm not here with anyone special or anything. Her smile became even bigger, but it also seemed more shy. Relief washed over her face. Good, she said, and just like that, she took a seat on the bar stool next to me. It couldn't have been easy for her in her fancy outfit. We sat side by side for a few minutes, just looking at each other without talking, People laughed and danced around us, and the music thrummed loudly. The bartender threw us some curious glances. I finally decided to let go of my nerves and start a conversation. I was beginning to really like her, and I knew if I didn't say something soon, I might never see her again. The thought made me feel heavy. I'm sorry, but I have to ask, I said politely. 
Do you have something special beneath that outfit? She laughed and replied, If you behave, perhaps you'll find out later. I felt myself blush. I wasn't used to that kind of attention. Seeing my unease, she reached out a black-gloved hand. I'm Gwen. My sister Annabelle's voice brought me back to reality, breaking the sweet memory into pieces. I opened my eyes to see her looking down at me with a worried smile. You know you could get hurt out here, right? She said playfully. I grinned. What, like that would make my day any worse? Despite herself, she laughed. Then she hugged me tightly. I'm so sorry, Jack. I know how much you cared about her. Annabelle was here, my sister. She had come to save me, just like she always did. I wrapped my arms around her and the tears began to flow again. This time, there was no holding them back. Take me home, Annabelle. The drive back to my sister's house was quiet, but I felt good about going home. Was it strange to call it home? Annabelle lived there with her husband and the twins. It was her place, not mine. But it had been my home once. The old farmhouse had belonged to our family for generations. When Mom passed away four years ago, it was left to me and Annabelle. Since Gwen and I had our own place, it made sense for my sister to have it. It was a large house with many rooms added over the years. There were enough bedrooms for everyone. When my sister and Duncan got married, I gave them my part of the house as a gift. So it belonged to them now. I had grown up there, though. Our mother and grandparents raised us in that house after our father left. Even after I moved out, it still felt like home in many ways. The familiar smells welcomed me back as I walked in. There was a fresh scent of babies, too, with little Jacqueline and Diana being just a year old. That was fine. They were my nieces, and I loved them. They were part of my family and my home. I called Duncan and let him know what's going on, my sister said as we entered the kitchen. The front door was for guests. The back door was for family. He said he'll pick up the girls on his way home. Does anyone else know? I was not ready for everyone to find out about my troubles. Luckily, my sister shook her head. No, Duncan won't say anything unless you agree first. Tammy asked when I dropped off the twins, but I only said there was an emergency on our side of the family. I sat down at the table while she got some tea. With just you and me left in the family, it won't take long for them to guess who you mean. Do your brother-in-law and his wife even know about the rest of the family? I don't think so. We haven't heard from Aunt Helen or Uncle Josh since Mom died. It really hurt them, I think. As for our cousins, Sharon is volunteering up north. Josh Jr. was in Pennsylvania working with Clocks and Doreen. Who knows where she is now? Still, James and Tammy will probably figure it out. But they are careful enough not to get involved unless we ask. Besides, they have their hands full with their kids. Their youngest just started to show his wild side. Isn't that supposed to be the terrible twos? I asked. My sister laughed. Trust me, my youngest nephew is a handful. She brought over two cups of steaming tea, placing one in front of me before sitting down across the table. It felt nice to be there, talking with her about family. It was comforting, and I could handle that. We chatted for a good two hours, and the conversation helped calm my thoughts and distract me from what had happened. But eventually, we had to face the truth. The big issue couldn't be ignored forever. My sister reached across the table and took my hand in hers. So, what happened? I took a deep breath, feeling a nervous shake in my body. I told her everything that had gone on, including how I had lost my cool. Annabelle raised her eyebrows at that. I began by sharing my thoughts about Gwen's birthday and ended with the moment a truck driver found me. I had more to say than I expected. I wish I could say it felt freeing to tell everything, but really, it felt more like poking at a sore spot and making it worse. Maybe it wouldn't have been so hard if that sore spot wasn't so close to my heart. My sister, bless her, listened patiently. She was really good at that. No warning at all, huh? She asked with understanding. Our cups of tea had gone cold, hardly touched. No, I replied. I didn't see anything wrong, and I can't think of any signs that things were off. It's still hard for me to understand. I sighed. Sure, Joe was around a lot, but lots of our friends are. Gwen knew him first, but I never came home to find him hanging around. She didn't talk about him any more than she did with anyone else. Maybe she danced with him more when we went out, but I was always there. Nothing ever happened in front of me. Annabelle frowned a bit. I hate to ask, but what about your relationship? I could only shrug here. It was great. 
or at least I thought so. She never complained and always seemed happy. More than happy. Honestly, she opened my eyes to things I never would have known. I hesitated, realizing there were some details I didn't want to discuss with my sister. Annabelle just smiled knowingly. After a little cough, I moved on. We were really close during the first year of our marriage, but it slowed down after that. From every other day to maybe once a week. I wondered if that was a clue. But I read that this happens in long-term relationships. She never said anything, and once a week still seems pretty good, right? Annabelle chuckled wryly. I have two little ones. Ask me how often my husband and I get time together now. I didn't want to explore that topic, so I shifted the conversation. I don't really remember what happened when I lost my temper. I know I said some things, but not clearly. I don't even remember leaving the house or driving. Shock, my sister replied. She had once worked as a nurse and had seen similar things before. Your mind can't handle everything at once, so it shuts down to help you cope. I've seen it with accident victims who seemed fine but went blank after witnessing something terrible. If you keep having these gaps, it might be good to talk to a therapist or something. But for now, though, I wouldn't worry too much about it. The real question, big brother, is what do you want to do about this? Annabelle moved her hand away from mine, pausing for a moment. You don't have to decide right now. Take your time to think. I nodded in agreement and stayed quiet. I should call work, I guess, to see if I can get a few days off. And we need to figure out how to get my car from the rest stop. Annabelle and I made some plans. Getting time off from work was a bit tricky. I explained what I could to the human resources person. I asked for family leave, but they said no. However, they did let me take three days of my personal time off. Since it was Wednesday, that gave me the weekend too, so I had until Tuesday morning to figure out what to do. I was finishing an email to my boss when Duncan came home with the twins. Duncan was quite the character. He and my sister seemed like an odd pair. She was almost as tall as I was, full-figured, naturally blonde with blue eyes, and really pretty. Duncan, on the other hand, was shorter, skinny, and often looked a bit silly. They also had a ten-year age difference. Still, they were clearly very much in love. And I liked Duncan. He worked hard and was a good dad and husband. His laugh was unique, but my sister loved it. And that was enough for me. However, he wasn't smiling when he approached me. Still wearing his work clothes, he sat down in one of the kitchen chairs while Annabelle took the kids to the living room. Hey, are you okay? He asked. I let out a deep sigh. Well, I'm here. That's something, right? Duncan nodded seriously. Better than not being here. Let's keep it that way. I didn't have a response to that, so I just nodded. Duncan knew about my past. I still had the scars from high school. My first love had hurt me deeply and almost brought me down completely. My sister knew too, but Annabelle trusted I wouldn't make those mistakes again. Though dark thoughts had crossed my mind during everything that happened, I wanted the heaviness to go away. I just wanted to escape how I felt. But I wasn't at the point where I wanted to harm myself. Not yet. I excused myself and headed upstairs to the guest bedroom. My old room was now the nursery for the girls, but it was okay. I was thankful to have a quiet place where I felt safe. Closing the door behind me, I kicked off my shoes and lay down. The comforting smell of home wrapped around me as I took a moment to relax and close my eyes, wanting to escape for a bit. I woke up feeling confused and short of breath. The room felt strange, and my first instinct was to reach out for Gwen. Panic hit me when I realized the space next to me was empty. I shot up, searching for her. The thought filled me with fear. Was she okay? Was she lost or in trouble? In the dark room, I couldn't make sense of her absence. It took a moment for the reality to sink in. Someone had taken her away from me. I curled up, hugging my knees. I felt like crying again, but I was all out of tears. I felt drained and empty. It was night, and the house was quiet. I couldn't hear my sister or her husband, and the twins were silent in their room down the hall. I checked my phone and saw it was close to midnight. There were no messages or missed calls. Gwen hadn't reached out to me. I hadn't tried to call her either, which felt unfair, yet it still hurt. Trying to shake off the dream, I sent her a text. Jack, you awake? I held the phone in my hand, waiting for her reply. It felt like forever, but it was only a minute or so. Outside, I could hear the familiar sound of a barn owl. When she finally replied, it was just one word. Gwen. 
Yes, I swallowed hard, feeling a heavy weight in my throat as I typed back. Jack, are you alone? It felt like ages before her response came through, about five minutes of waiting that felt torturous. Gwen. No. My heart sank. It felt like a blow to my chest. Knowing she was with someone was not as comforting as I hoped. I almost asked who she was with, but a dark thought crossed my mind, making me hesitate. Why even ask? I took a few deep breaths, trying to think carefully about what I wanted to say before I messaged her again. Jack, can we talk? I really need to talk to you. Minutes passed without a reply. Jack, please? Finally, she responded with a short message. Gwen, tomorrow. A wave of frustration surged within me. I would have to wait. Maybe it was fair since I had left, but it made me feel like I was losing her even more. It made me question if I had any real connection with my wife to begin with. Had part of our marriage been a lie? Did she ever care for me? If she couldn't move on from him, why had she married me? The truth was clear. Joe was struggling in life. He changed jobs frequently, didn't have a car, and shared an apartment with several others with no clear future ahead. Me? I had a job, a little money saved up, and most people thought I was a dependable guy. It bothered me to think that maybe she had married me just for security. Maybe I had never truly been her husband. Perhaps I was just someone to count on, and I was too naive to see it. The only way to find out was to talk to her. Morning around ten? I'll get bagels, I texted. Whatever, Gwen replied. Gwen knew me well enough to know how to get under my skin. I wiped my nose on my shirt sleeve and pushed forward. Okay, ten with bagels. I love you, Gwen, I sent back, but there was no answer. I waited for an hour, sitting on the bed and staring at my phone, hoping for a reply, but nothing came. Eventually, I lay back on the bed, feeling defeated. I told myself I had already lost her. Doubts swirled in my head, making me feel like my whole life was a lie. I stayed there, feeling trapped by anxiety that I thought I had overcome. I began to wonder if just letting go might be the easier choice. I hadn't thought like that in a long time. I had battled with sadness before, but I thought I had finally won. My friend Duncan's words echoed in my mind. I had promised myself that I wouldn't do anything foolish. But now I questioned if seeking peace was really foolish. Who really needed me in this world? As dawn approached, one of the twins began to cry, and the house started to wake up. I could hear my brother-in-law moving around in the nursery, talking to whichever daughter was upset. My sister's voice flowed through the hall. My family was waking, and soon I could smell coffee drifting into my room. Life continued around me, whether I was part of it or not. With a heavy heart, I finally got out of bed. I hadn't slept well, felt completely drained, was still in my work clothes from yesterday, and I dreaded what the day might bring. I felt hopeless. But there was the promise of bagels. Maybe the bakery would have those delicious French toast ones. Perhaps they had poppy seed bagels, too. Weren't there stories about people testing positive for drugs because of poppy seeds? Regardless, there would be bagels. Sometimes... It's the little things that help us carry on. When I stepped out of my room, I nearly bumped into my sister. Hey, silly, I was just about to wake you up. She stepped back and took a look at me. Wow, Jack, you look worse than when I picked you up. Feeling too weak to reply, I just managed a weary smile. You need a shower, she said firmly. She placed her hands on my shoulders, turned me around and pointed me toward the bathroom. You know where everything is, get cleaned up. There's a robe on the back of the door. Toss your clothes into the hallway and I'll wash them. I did what she asked. It felt nice to have someone tell me what to do. The warm water poured over me as I sat in the tub, letting the spray wash away my worries. It was calming, even if it didn't help my sadness. The sound of water was soothing and kept my mind busy. I stayed in the shower for a long time before I finally decided I needed to get moving. I knew there was another bathroom in the house, but I didn't want to use up all the hot water. I emerged from the bathroom wearing a white robe that I suspected my sister had borrowed from a hotel. In the kitchen, Annabelle was trying to feed both of my nieces in their high chairs. Duncan stood nearby, holding a cup of coffee and a mop. Look, girls, she said sweetly to my messy nieces. If you don't eat, you'll end up looking like Uncle Jack. And you don't want that, right? I smiled shyly. I had caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror on my way out. The shower had helped a little, but not much. 
My sister pointed toward the fridge. You missed dinner last night. There's a plate in there for you, chicken with rice and beans. Sit and eat. Thanks, Annabelle, I said as I put the food in the microwave, remembering to take off the tin foil. The clock said it was 7.20. Can we get my car this morning? I have a few things to take care of. Already done, Jack, Duncan said with a smile. He took a sip of his coffee. We took care of it last night while you were sleeping. One of the twins made a mess with her food, splattering it everywhere, and the other one laughed and joined in. Their parents just smiled as they cleaned up. Are you going to talk to Gwen? It seemed my sister had decided to call Gwen the bitch. Annabelle had a knack for holding on to grudges, so that nickname would probably stick for a while. Yeah, I'm going back over at 10. I thought we could sit down and figure out where things went wrong, maybe see if there's a way to resolve it. Do you want to resolve it? My brother-in-law's question made me uncomfortable. I'm not sure. I shrugged helplessly. On one hand, we've been married for six years. We've known each other for almost nine. It's tough to just let it all go, you know? And you still care about her. My sister was sharp. Yeah, yeah, I still care about her. The microwave beeped, and I took the plate out carefully and sat down with them. The food smelled amazing. My stomach grumbled a little at the thought of eating, and knowing it was one of Duncan's meals made it even better. Not that my sister Annabelle could cook. It tasted as good as it smelled. On the other hand, I managed to say after my first bite, I hesitated to speak, knowing how hard it was to express what was on my mind. On the other hand, from what she said, she's been with him for a while, probably close to ten years, I think. That means she's been less than truthful with me this whole time. Annabelle's eyes widened in shock and concern. Ten years, Jack? She's been unfaithful for ten years, and you never noticed? That was not the right thing to say. What little appetite I had disappeared, and I gently put my fork down. To be fair, her husband chimed in, we didn't notice either, Annabelle. It's a long time to keep something like this hidden without anyone finding out. Plus, if she's been involved with this guy before she met your brother, there wouldn't have been any changes for Jack to see. My sister calmed down a bit. I'm sorry, Jack, I can't believe that she's been able to get away with this for so long. If I find out that someone knew about them all this time, I'm going to be really angry. The twins were getting fidgety with all the noise, reaching out to their mother. She began cleaning their little faces and hands as she spoke. With a playful smile, she nudged her nose against one daughter, then the other. Would you like to help mommy get back at her? Yes, you would, I know you would. The parents started tidying up while I picked at my food. I ate a bit more, mostly because my sister was watching me closely. I have to go to work, Jack, Duncan said. You should stay here again tonight if you want, but remember, this is your home too. Don't let her push you out. Annabelle nodded. We need to leave soon too. The twins have a play date at 8.30 and we need to hurry. Want me to help get them ready? I asked genuinely. She shook her head. No, I can handle it. You should step outside for a moment before you see her, though. I nodded. After finishing half my breakfast, I wrapped the rest in foil and put it away. Duncan tossed me my car keys. I hugged my sister and touched each of my nieces on the head. Jack? My sister called softly as I went to change clothes. Yeah? Annabelle paused for a moment. Just be careful, okay? I smiled at her, trying to lighten the mood. I promise. Joe, Duncan and now Annabelle. All three warned me not to do anything I might regret. The problem was, there were many actions that could be seen as silly. Leaving Gwen alone and upset the day before felt like a big mistake. Was I thinking about giving up? That thought stuck in my mind. The sadness spoke to me, suggesting life might not be worth it if someone I loved could deceive me for so long. It convinced me that no one would truly miss me in the end. Gwen had Joe. Annabelle had her family. As for my friends, the game we played could continue without me, as if I had just moved away. On social media, was I really anything more than a small name on their screens? These thoughts were familiar. I thought I had dealt with them years ago. I hadn't seen a therapist since the end of college. Yet here I was again. Would it be silly to confront Joe? It might help me feel better or at least less helpless. But what if things escalated? That would make me feel worse. What if he called the authorities? Could I really handle that? Then there was Gwen. What was the better choice? Giving her another chance or moving on? 
The card from the trucker was still in my wallet. Should I call him or was it smarter to wait? I sat in the local park for about an hour, feeling down, before I finally decided to leave. Meeting Gwen was important. I had to face my worries. As much as I dreaded the potential answers, I knew I couldn't avoid it. The line at the coffee shop was short, which was a relief. I got tea for me, coffee for her, and a bag of bagels to share as I drove back home to my wife. It was just before ten when I parked and entered through the garage. I found Gwen sitting at the kitchen table deep in thought. Her long black hair was pulled behind one ear, and her arms were crossed over her chest. Instead of her usual attire, she wore an old t-shirt and sweatpants, a big change from her typical style. I didn't say anything as I put the coffee in front of her. I sat down across the table, opened the bag of bagels, and pushed it a little her way. We need to talk, I said gently. Gwen scoffed. You didn't want to talk yesterday. That was fair. She was upset and I had to remind myself to stay calm. No, I didn't. Yesterday I just needed to get away. I had to think. You left me. You got upset. You got angry and then you just left me here crying. It felt like Gwen wanted to make this difficult for both of us. I took a sip of my tea, wishing I had added more honey. Can you blame me? I asked plainly, but without being hurtful. I walked in to find my spouse with one of our friends, and then I learned she's been with him the whole time we were married. How was I supposed to react, Gwen? What were you expecting would happen if you both got caught? I'm sorry if I stepped away when you needed me, but I was hurt. You hurt me. I'm still hurting. I looked at her firmly. What would you have done? She slumped back in her chair, looking down at the table. It doesn't matter now, I guess. Gwen peeked up at me from under her dark lashes. So what do we do now? It all depends, I guess. I pushed my tea aside and leaned forward, resting my arms on the table. You said you still love me. Is that true, Gwen? The smile on her face carried sadness as she said, I never stopped loving you, Jack. That was a beginning. It felt like a sharp pain in my chest, but at least it was a start. Then came the tough part. It was more of a statement than a question, but it got to the core of things. But you also care about Joe. I... My wife couldn't look me in the eye. She struggled to find her words, her voice soft. I do. Just not in the same way. It's hard to explain, Jack. So what? The connection is different? No, it's not different, I pressed. It's just unique, that's all. I don't see why it's special. Gwen rolled her eyes, still avoiding my gaze. Jack, it's not about that. You're focusing on things that don't matter. I wouldn't give up. So he is different. Finally, our eyes met, her expression filled with frustration. Yes, she answered with a hint of sarcasm. He's a magician or something. Is that what you want to hear, Jack? Will that make you feel better? Gwen, just tell me the truth. I was losing my cool. Why have you been seeing him? What wasn't I giving you? Did you want more time together? Was I taking you for granted? Am I not enough for you? With each question, she shook her head, her long hair swaying gently. No, 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 what? Do you think marriage is just about who gets to be with me, Jack? No, maybe it comes with certain expectations, but I believed marriage was about trust. Now I'm finding out that what I thought was solid is a complete deception. You're friends. That's not true. Gwen ignored my response and continued. If you met someone on the street or in a sketchy bar, it wouldn't mean anything compared to what I have with Joe. I wouldn't even know her. Was she really not seeing how selfish that was? Besides, you wouldn't even do it. I know you, Jack. You've always been a one-woman man. The room fell silent filled with a tension we were both afraid to break. My heart felt heavier than ever. She was right. Even if Gwen accepted that our relationship could open up, I would never be with anyone else. It made me realize something else as well. You're right, I finally said, breaking the silence. I wouldn't. And the person I thought I married wouldn't either. But maybe she never really existed. I stood up and gently pushed my chair back. I could feel her eyes on me the whole time. I'll sleep in the guest bedroom until we figure out what to do with the house. A confused look crossed her face. What do you mean, what to do with the house? And you can't be serious about sleeping in the guest room, Jack. We're married. We're not, I said firmly. 
Sure, we have a piece of paper that says we are, but do we really act like it? I shrugged, feeling the weight of despair. You may know me, but I don't know you. I don't even know who you are, Gwen. We can always get another paper that says we're not married. Her face went pale, and she stood up slowly, holding onto the table for support as she approached me. She clearly hadn't expected this. Divorce! No, Jack! What? I already have a lawyer ready to go. I let that slip, even though I hadn't called anyone yet. I could feel the card in my wallet. I'll get in touch and start the process. You should probably find one, too. Can we at least try counseling first? Or go on a long trip together? Just the two of us, where we can work it out? How can we work things out, Gwen? I turned to her, my frustration building again. You've been dishonest with me the entire time. How can I trust you now? Even if you were willing to let Joe go, which I can tell you're not, how would I believe you without looking over my shoulder all the time? I don't even know if he's the only one. How many others have you been with? Suddenly she slapped me, catching me by surprise. Gwen quickly went from scared to very angry, and even though she was small, her slap left my face stinging. I'm not what you think, she shouted, tears streaming down her face. There hasn't been anyone else, just you and Joe. You can be mad at me, Jack. I understand if you want to hate me for this, but don't call me names. She pointed a finger at me, sharp and fierce. She had hit me. I knew she had come from a tough background, and she had promised many times that she would never act like the person who hurt her. I stared at her, surprised, and then felt a mix of emotions. You cheat and then hit? I guess you've picked up some things from your father, huh? Gwen gasped, as if I'd knocked the air out of her. I knew this was a low blow. Her father had been unfaithful and abusive, something she had talked about often. The shock on her face showed I had struck a nerve and I didn't feel great about it. A soft cry escaped from her lips. That's when I heard a quiet cough from the living room, making me close my eyes and breathe deeply. Gwen had texted that she wasn't alone last night. He's still here, isn't he? Gwen stood her ground, crossing her arms. Yes, Joe is still here. He came back for me last night. Not like my husband. Joe appeared in the doorway, casual in his jeans and t-shirt. He seemed a bit shocked, but spoke calmly. Gwen, this isn't going well. I think it's best if I talk to Jack for a moment. I was astonished. Why would I want to hear anything from you? Do you still love Gwen, Jack? That question made me furious. Yes, I replied. I do. At least the Gwen I thought I married. She's still the same person, Jack. She's still your wife. Still the woman who loves you. He gestured with open hands. You're just learning more about each other. It's tough for both of you. But you still have love. And that's why you should listen to me. Maybe I shouldn't have been so shocked that Gwen and Joe had been together for a while. We weren't exactly models, but Joe sure knew how to talk. He always sounded sincere in what he said. I felt torn. I glanced at Gwen on my left and then back at Joe on my right. My instincts told me to get out of that room. Nothing good would come from talking more, and I feared it would only make things worse. But a part of me still didn't want to give up. After having Gwen in my life for eight years, was I really ready to throw all that away? I took a step back and leaned against the kitchen counter. All right, Joe, I said, waving at him. You can try to change my mind about the divorce. Gwen sat down again, crossing her legs and folding her arms in front of her. Joe nodded and cleared his throat. Instead of sitting, he leaned against the doorframe that led to the living room. You say you love Gwen, Jack, he began. But can you tell me what it is about her that you love? There are so many things... It was a simple question, one I had asked myself before to remind me not to take her for granted. Where do I begin? Her laugh? Her eyes? Those were the first things that drew me to her. The way she looks when she's peacefully resting next to me. Like she finally feels at ease. I love her taste in music and how she playfully sings off-key in the shower. We enjoy the same kinds of movies. I take her out dancing, even though I don't particularly enjoy it. I just love watching her express herself to the music and she never feels threatened by my female friends or co-workers, which is a big change from my last two girlfriends. I chose not to think about my first girlfriend. That was a memory of its own. What else? She encourages me to play games with my friends every Saturday without complaint, and... I paused, closing my eyes for a moment. I can't believe how blind I've been. You didn't want to join my game because that's when you saw Gwen, didn't you, Joe? He nodded without excuse. 
Four or five hours of quality time almost every Saturday. It wasn't just about being together, Jack. We went on genuine outings while you were busy. But back to the main point, Jack. What do you love about Gwen? I felt overwhelmed by this new information. Did anyone else in our gaming group know what was happening? Our group had been together for a long time, and anyone among the twenty or so members might have known about Joe and Gwen without saying a word. I also struggled to find more words to answer Joe's question. What else did I love about Gwen? Finally, I spoke softly, unable to look at either of them as I continued. I loved that she was always there for me. Gwen made a small sound that caught my attention. I loved being there for her, too. I loved that we trusted each other completely. We could share anything. We never fought. We would get upset with each other sometimes, that's true, and I know we could test each other's patience. But we never really fought. We could talk things out. We could be honest with each other. I took a deep breath. I had trouble trusting people for a long time before I met Gwen. But with her, that went away. I felt like I could trust her. I must have looked so sad. I trusted you, Gwen. My wife came back into the conversation. Most of her anger seemed to have faded, and like me, she looked defeated. We wanted to tell you, Jack, she admitted softly. We didn't talk about you, but we did think about telling you. We didn't know how to do it without causing you pain. We were scared it would make you feel this way. Over time, we stopped worrying about it and just hoped for the best. There were a few close calls over the years. Joe smiled sheepishly at me. A couple of times you stayed home sick or your plans got canceled. Once, I was stuck in your closet for a few hours while you and Gwen were spending time together. I really didn't need to hear that. The thought of Gwen and me having moments together after Joe had already been with her crossed my mind. He must have noticed the look on my face because he quickly stopped smiling and looked away. You know the sad part, Gwen? I asked looking her in the eye. If you and Joe had told me about this early on, when we first started dating and been honest about everything, to my surprise, I laughed, but not out of happiness. It just came out. I might have actually been okay with it. I've always thought of myself as open-minded. You've talked me into trying new things over the years. You could probably have convinced me to be part of what was happening. Imagine a three-way. You, Joe, and me. Why not? A little fun for everyone but you lied to me. Hearing that felt like pulling an arrow out of my chest and the pain was worse than before. You lied to me for eight long years. And here's the hard part, Gwen. If you had told me the truth last week, I might have been open to getting help. If you had confided in me instead of me finding out by chance, I would have tried. There would have been a lot of talking, of course. We would have had to discuss how Joe fits into all this. But no, I only found out by luck. If that hadn't happened, you'd still be hiding the truth from me, Gwen. And I can't continue our marriage like this. Joe straightened up, looking serious. But don't you want to know why, Jack? It doesn't matter. Yes, it does, he replied firmly. It matters to me. It matters to Gwen. Why do you think I'm trying to help you two stay together? I care about her so much that I'm willing to support both of you because she finds joy in both of us. Her happiness comes from all of us. If you leave her, it will hurt her more than you know. I wasn't sure about that, but my feelings were all over the place. I felt angry one moment and sad the next, and my stomach was turning. This was important to them. What about me? Okay, then. You want me to ask again, Joe? Fine. I had gotten up from the counter and walked several steps closer. Joe was just out of reach. I was even closer to Gwen, so I aimed my question at her. If you care about Joe so much and have known him for so long, why did you marry me instead? That question caught them off guard, and it showed in their nervous glances. But Gwen stepped up to answer. Because you give me things he can't, Jack. I need stability and someone I can count on. I want to come home to someone who will be there for me, someone I can care for and who cares for me. I want someone I can start a family with. That's you, Jack. It's always been you. Her words hit me hard. When she said we're ready, I knew she wasn't talking about the two of us. You. What? I couldn't think straight for a moment. I knew the word flabbergasted, but this was the first time I truly felt it. You were going to let me... You were going to have Joe's kids and tell me they were mine? She looked taken aback, suddenly unsure. 
They might have been his. They could have been yours, too. I wouldn't mind who the real father was, Jack. I'd love them no matter what. But you'd be a better father than he would. Joe added his thoughts. And you would be. Look at me. I'm a freelance writer, and my job takes me all over the place. I can't afford a stable life, and I live paycheck to paycheck. But I've always wanted kids, even if I know I wouldn't be a great dad. Do you know how hard it is for me to stand here and admit that you're the better choice? We might never know for sure if they were my kids or yours. Maybe some would be yours and some would be mine. It wouldn't matter. I'd accept them as mine, and you would think they were yours, and no one would need to know differently. I knew they were in good hands with a nice guy who could really be like a father to them. This was too much. I can't believe you two. This is crazy. First, you both had a secret relationship behind my back. Then you make me feel bad for finding out, and now you say I'm boring. That's not what I meant, my wife said quickly. And now you are planning to trick me into raising kids that aren't mine because he won't step up? Were you both going to leave and enjoy life while I was stuck with everything? This can't be real. They were both talking so loudly that it was hard to hear anything else. Jack, no. Gwen and I weren't thinking that. You just don't understand. Oh, Jack, that's not what we want. Please try to see it from our side. I took a deep breath to calm myself. I was so mixed up, I didn't even know how I felt anymore. Shock was taking over again. I knew I'd hear things I didn't want to hear, but this was too much. Okay, I said, trying to think through the confusion in my head. I was anything but okay. I felt dizzy and had to lean against the counter for support. A headache made it hard to focus. I looked out the window and saw how lovely the day was. Okay, I repeated. Fighting back my emotions, I turned to look at Gwen. She had sat down again, hugging her knees to her chest, resting her chin on them and staring at me. She looked beautiful. I remembered all the good moments we had together, laughing at bars, going shopping, cozying up on rainy Sundays with books and warm drinks, talking about movies we wanted to see. We had shared exciting nights that left us breathless, and sweet moments that were just as special without going any further. I remembered holding her while she told me about her tough childhood, letting her cry when bad memories surfaced. I remembered her holding my hands as I shared my struggles as a teenager, how heartbreak had affected me, and how she promised she would never hurt me like that. Just yesterday, she told me she loved me and never meant to hurt me. I have two questions, I said quickly. I need to ask these before we go any further. Unsteadily, I walked over to Gwen and gently took her hand. I could feel her small fingers shake. We were both feeling so much confusion as our lives seemed to fall apart. Gwen, you said you love me. Have you always loved me? Is that true? Yes, she replied without a doubt. Yes, Jack, I do. She said it just like she did when we got married six years ago, full of love and sincerity. I took a deep breath. This was the question that mattered most. If I asked you to, Gwen, would you stop seeing Joe? For good. Would you be willing to move far away with me and never see him again? Would you? Do you care about me enough to do that? Tears filled her eyes as she realized what I was asking. Please don't ask me that, Jack, she said softly. Don't make me choose. I promise I don't love Joe more than you. I care about both of you. I need you both. Her face turned red as she cried, and she held onto my hand tightly. I recalled how often we had comforted each other in tough times. Shh. I gently brushed her hair back to calm her. It's okay, Gwen. I won't make you decide. Hope sparked in her eyes through the tears. But it faded as I slowly pulled my hand away and stepped back. I would make the choice for her. No, she cried, shaking her head. Jack, please don't do this. We can figure this out. I can't live like this, Gwen. I can't just accept it. You've been untruthful with me. No, Jack, I... Untruthful? I'm sorry I didn't tell you about Joe. I'm sorry you found out like this, but please, don't do this. Yes, Gwen, I said, holding up a finger. First, you were with him behind my back. And second, I held up another finger. You claimed you didn't care for him more than me. My soon-to-be ex-wife struggled to speak through her tears. I don't, Jack. I don't care for him more than you. I just... You do, Gwen. It hurt me to say it, but I felt it was true. She and Joe had broken trust, and I felt terrible for ending it this way. 
You chose to keep your relationship with him secret from me. I had no idea, and I wouldn't have known if I hadn't come home early yesterday. You kept this from me while he knew about our life together the whole time. He called himself my friend. You were honest with him, but you didn't show me the same honesty or respect. This was the truth, a point she couldn't deny. Joe had been aware of everything. He knew about my connection with Gwen, our marriage, even the moments we shared together. He was the one in the shadows while I was there with her, showing her support every day. I didn't know anything. Joe was upset. His frustration grew when I tried to leave the kitchen. How can you just walk away? Are you really going to leave her like this? After everything she's done for you? You're throwing away the best thing in your life. He pounded his chest. I care about her so much that I'm willing to share. Are you really so selfish that you won't do the same? I felt exhausted. My response was flat, just acceptance. Do you really love her enough to stay after she hasn't been truthful with you this whole time? If the roles were reversed, would you be able to forgive her? Yes, he answered quickly and confidently, which surprised me and made me smile just a little. Well, congrats, Joe. Now you're the better man. I hope that helps you with what you're feeling. There was more yelling and pleading. I tuned it all out. I didn't have anything else to say. Gwen was in deep distress, and I felt a pang of sorrow seeing her like that. But I knew I couldn't stay in this marriage. I finally stepped past Joe and into the living room. He tried to follow, still expressing how unfair I was being to Gwen, saying if I truly loved her, I would understand. That's when I picked up a lamp and threw it in his direction. It missed him but crashed against the doorframe, shattering in pieces. Gwen stepped into the kitchen doorway, shocked. I didn't look at her but stared at Joe until he raised his hands in surrender and stepped back. In the bedroom, I packed my things into a couple of suitcases. My important documents were in our shared deposit box and would have to be collected later. Everything else? The little decorations and memories? I didn't want them. They would only remind me of Gwen. Duncan had told me not to let her force me out of the house, and I'd planned to take the guest bedroom. But that wasn't going to work. I knew she and Joe would become close again, and I wasn't going to stay and watch. When I came out of the bedroom, they were gone. Her car was missing, too. I wondered about Joe's old car and realized he likely parked it somewhere nearby to keep it out of sight. Not that it mattered anymore. Where could they have gone? Who knew? I didn't care. I just wanted to get away. That's when I noticed they had taken the bag of bagels with them. It annoyed me a little. Amid all the chaos, I hadn't had a moment to grab a bite to eat. Before I could leave the house, I had one last thing to do. I set my bags down and pulled out my wallet to find the business card. I carefully typed the number into my phone and waited for someone to pick up. When someone answered, I felt nervous, like I was standing on the edge of a cliff. Hello, I said back to the friendly voice. My name is Jack Brandt. Ted White gave me your number. He used to work with you. I need to set up an appointment with Mr. Lin. After another friendly question from the receptionist, I sighed and answered. Yes, I am getting a divorce. Divorce is not like what you see in movies or magazines. It's long, tough, and can cost a lot. Sure, if you have money and a good job, it might not hit you as hard. But for most of us, there are court costs, legal fees, and counseling costs, all adding up. And yes, I mentioned counseling costs. My lawyer was decent, but we ended up in front of a judge who really valued marriage. The judge insisted that Gwen and I attend ten counseling sessions before we could move forward with the divorce. We never made it past four. I couldn't forgive the hurt from the past, and Gwen wasn't ready to let go of Joe. The therapist decided to stop when Joe showed up at the last session. Gwen thought he should join us. That was the turning point. I sent a letter to the lawyers and the judge saying we were done. The judge reluctantly agreed, but made it clear that we still owed for all ten sessions. I didn't have the energy to fight it. Gwen didn't seem to care either. Outside of the counseling and court dates, I didn't see her or speak to her. My calls and emails went unanswered. I even had to get a restraining order to keep Gwen and her partner away from my sister's home. It was harsh, but I wanted to move on. In the end, we had to hire an agency to sell the things we didn't want to split. Our house was sold, and the money went to pay off the mortgage and legal fees. There wasn't much left for either of us. As for the rest of our finances, I caught a break. The judge wanted to make me pay support since I started the divorce, but Gwen earned slightly more than I did at her internet job. Because of this, she would have had to pay me support. At least that's what my lawyer said. 
I didn't push it. The most important thing about divorce that no one warns you about is how it affects people beyond just the couple and any kids involved. It affects many people. My mother-in-law and brother-in-law never really liked me for some reason, so I doubt they were bothered much. There weren't any last-minute calls from Gwen's family expressing sympathy for my situation. Who knows what she told them? Still, they probably had to deal with her. But the rest of the people around us, wow, our friends were divided. Some told me I should have stayed with Gwen while others said I was better off. Some just slowly stepped away from both of us, not wanting to get mixed up in the drama, and I never heard from them again. Our group of friends changed completely. We didn't have many friends, either online or in person, but our breakup affected our small community in ways we didn't see coming. It was tough. More people I thought were my friends left me before the divorce was even finished. My sadness only grew. Thankfully, I still had my sister and her family to support me. There were days when I felt like a robot just going through the motions, but they were there for me. I did my best to help them, too, whenever I could. I mostly spoiled my nieces a lot. It helped take my mind off things and gave me something to look forward to, while also giving Annabelle and Duncan some time together. You know, that might be one of the few good things that came out of my divorce. My sister and her husband seemed closer than ever. It was like having a big problem nearby pushed them together more. Their marriage had been good before, but now, now it seemed almost perfect. I wanted to feel jealous, but I couldn't. So I found joy in introducing their girls to treats like ice cream and chocolate, just small amounts, of course. My wife initially opposed the divorce. She and her lawyer tried to delay everything they could. But eventually, she lost hope and let it go through without argument. Finally, seven months after I found out about the shocking news, the papers were signed. Gwen looked very serious and quiet, saying little. Joe was there, too, glaring at me the whole time for reasons I can't understand. When I left the judge's office with my lawyer, I didn't look back. I walked straight out. I knew that if I turned around and saw Gwen looking at me, I would have fallen apart. It was strange to think you could still care for someone who caused you so much hurt. I then drove to meet Mr. Lin at his office again to finish up some last paperwork. I thanked him for his help, and he gave me a packet of resources and support groups for people going through divorces. We said our goodbyes. Like the truck driver who had helped me before, I now also carried a couple of Mr. Lin's business cards in my wallet. And that was it. I was free. I thought I could leave my life with Gwen behind and move forward. But why did I drive back to the house? It sat empty. The real estate agents had cleared everything out to prepare it for sale. No one had bought it yet, but there were still people interested. I hoped it would sell soon. I needed to pay my bills. Since I still had the keys, I went in to take one last look at the place I had called home for more than six years. The silence was heavy. Without the furniture and decorations, even the smallest sound echoed. It felt eerily quiet. I entered through the garage again and slowly made my way to the living room. The wooden floors shone as if they were brand new, and the walls were bright white, freshly painted. Somehow the house looked emptier than when we first moved in. The agents had removed every hint of our presence. I knew you'd come back here one last time. I turned to see Gwen standing in the kitchen doorway. I had been so lost in thought that I hadn't noticed her car arrive or the door open. She wore the same black dress and high heels from the courthouse. I was still in my suit coat and tie. Yeah, well, I gestured to the empty space around us. I thought it wouldn't hurt to take one last look, just to make sure we didn't miss anything. I glanced past her. Joe isn't with you? My ex-wife shook her head. He's back at our apartment making dinner. I told him I needed some time alone. I nodded, though I didn't really understand what she was feeling. Whatever it was, she and Joe would have to sort it out. It wasn't my concern anymore. You'd think I would feel better about that. I'm surprised you're not out celebrating, Gwen said, walking to the sliding glass doors that led to the patio. This is what you wanted, right? I squared my shoulders and let out a heavy sigh. No, Gwen, it isn't. This is just what had to happen. Gwen looked out at the neatly trimmed backyard. When we bought the house, we had dreamed of it being a perfect place for children to play. Now, that dream was gone. I'm sorry, Jack, she said softly. This isn't how it was supposed to be. Sorry that I found out. 
Sorry that it altered our marriage and the trust I had in you. I believe that, I sighed. But nothing you've said makes me think you feel remorse about what happened with Joe all these years. She didn't answer. Her eyes remained glued to the lawn outside where our children would never play. I should go, I said, heading for the door. If she wanted to be alone, I wouldn't stop her. It was time for me to start living again. I wasn't sure what to do, but I had to figure something out. I was almost back in the kitchen when she called my name. I could hear her quiet footsteps coming closer. Jack, did it really have to end this way? Do you feel differently about me now? Her question stopped me in my tracks. I stood in the doorway, not looking at her and trying to think of the right words. Yes. My voice was steady. And no. I turned to face her again and shrugged. Yes, this is how it ends, Gwen. It's not how we wanted things to be. But we can't both get what we wanted. And no, I don't hold any ill will toward you. I feel let down like I've been deeply hurt. It pains me to look at you and remember what we could have had and how things turned out instead. It hurts to think that I might never see you again. To be honest, I have no idea how to get through tomorrow or the days after that. But I don't hold any ill will toward you. I gave her a weary smile. I still care about you. Maybe I'm just being foolish. The smile faded. But if we had stayed together, if you and Joe had made me go along with everything, then yes, I would have ended up feeling differently about you. I would have grown resentful and all of us would have felt worse. This way, we're free. You're free. You still have Joe, and you'll be okay. Gwen stepped closer, sadness on her face as she placed her hands on my chest. I shouldn't have let her come that close. I closed my eyes, allowing myself to feel the warmth of her touch. But who do you have, Jack? She was crying, leaning her head against me. Without thinking, I wrapped my arms around her. It was painful, but it felt good to hold her again. I hadn't touched her since that day everything changed, and it felt comforting to have her close. Then I started to cry too, realizing she was crying for me. You're going to be alone again like when I found you, she said, pouting lightly as she touched my shoulder. You hate being alone. Maybe I'll find someone else, I offered weakly. I'm still young. But deep down, I didn't want anyone else. I wanted the Gwen I loved. I held her tight, not wanting to let go. One hand cradled the back of her head as I rested the other on her waist. We cried together for what we shared, and for what we could never have again. That's when I did something I shouldn't have. I leaned down to rest my head gently against hers. As I leaned closer, she lifted her head to talk to me, and our lips brushed together. It was a quick and unexpected touch, but the feeling caught us off guard. Gwen and I exchanged surprised looks for a few moments as we absorbed the shared connection. Then, the overwhelming emotions took over. We embraced with urgency, wanting to feel each other's warmth one last time. There were no words, just soft sounds of longing as we held on to each other tightly. When I felt tired, I showed her how much I cared. Gwen moved closer to express her feelings. We held each other tightly, almost desperately, reminding ourselves of the bond we once had. In that empty house, we let our emotions take over, sometimes crying, sometimes laughing until we felt both fulfilled and empty. It was like all the moments of closeness we might have shared in a lifetime were packed into that one afternoon. It wasn't love in the usual sense, and it wasn't simply physical. It was two people who had once meant everything to each other, saying goodbye for the last time. Afterward, we embraced quietly. We didn't look at each other, and there was a silence between us. This was our final moment together and neither of us wanted it to end. I felt lost about the future, scared of being alone because I still cared deeply for her. Eventually, we stood up after what felt like a long time and began to put on what was left of our clothes. As we parted ways, we shared one last hug and walked out of each other's lives. I thought now was the time for things to change for me. I wanted to get my act together, go to the gym, get fit, start a business, and make money doing something I loved. I imagined meeting someone who would appreciate me, whether she had been nearby all along or I met her soon after. I could see my life becoming great. As for Gwen, I pictured her facing the consequences of her choices, learning to navigate the challenges life presented after the choices she made. 
Or maybe we might find a way to reconnect. Perhaps Joe would leave her, and she would come back to me, trying to rekindle the bond we once had, and we would think about building a future together. Or perhaps she married Joe, and that would be an unexpected twist. But that's not how it went. Because life isn't a dream. I never saw Gwen again after that last afternoon. I never heard from her or Joe. Occasionally, I thought about reaching out to her, but I never did. I told myself I needed to move on, and looking back would not help. I did hear about them occasionally. It was bound to happen. They got married, and I celebrated alone with a drink. But after a couple of years, they faded from my life completely. I didn't even know if they were still living in the same state or city. As for me, no, I didn't find success. This sad event didn't make me think about my life or help me grow as a person. Instead, I fell. I fell hard. My boss was not kind, and despite the support from our HR department, I lost my job four months later due to performance issues. No, there weren't many single women who wanted to date me. Sure, I had some kind friends, but that's all they were, friends offering sympathy. Most of them were happily married, so there was nothing more there. Those who weren't married saw me as someone who had been through too much. The rest doesn't matter much. For the next 14 years, I went from job to job and state to state. I stopped playing games, stopped socializing. I deleted all my social media accounts. I used a simple flip phone and rarely went out. Dating was not an option. I didn't trust anyone. For 14 years, all I did was work and go home. At home, I ate a little, read a little, watched TV, and slept. At night, I would take long, wandering walks. I was a grumpy, unhappy person. Life had hurt me, and in return, I wanted to hurt it back, so I did in small, petty ways. Annabelle couldn't always tell where I was. I pulled away from her, too. Seeing my sister with her loving family was too painful for me. Every Christmas, I sent her and Duncan as much money as I could for their kids. I didn't even know how many kids they had after a while. That was all I could offer. Can you imagine that? Fifteen years of just existing? No family, no friends? I wasn't living, I was just getting by. My weight dropped so low you could see my ribs. I wore clothes from thrift stores, choosing them just to last. I hated life, hated living, and hated myself. I believed the world didn't owe me anything, so I owed it nothing either. Thoughts of giving up were always close by. Maybe my ex-wife hadn't meant to hurt me so deeply, but the embarrassment lingered for years. My self-confidence as a man and a person had taken a hit from her dishonesty. It haunted me for a long time, even after I mostly pushed her from my mind. I'm sorry to hear you're feeling this way. It's really important to talk to someone who can help you, such as a mental health professional or a trusted person in your life. It was finally over. I felt a wave of relief wash over me. In my wallet, I had a laminated card that stated I did not want to be resuscitated. This meant my chances of making it were very low, but that was okay. People were screaming around me, and loud noises filled the air. I realized too late that there had been a robbery. Someone had tried to rob the store while I walked in, and for some reason, I had been shot. It was a senseless act, and it looked like it would lead to my pointless end. But that was all right. I felt sorry for my sister. Annabelle was strong. She would be fine without me, especially with Duncan and the kids around. Nobody else would miss me since I didn't really have any friends. I didn't even think about Gwen. She had been out of my life for so long that I didn't feel the need to consider her. The pain in my stomach and chest became worse, wrapping around me in a flood of hurt. I should have felt panic. My instincts should have kicked in, and I should have been filled with fear. But nothing happened. I had been unhappy for so long that it had changed me. My awareness of what was happening faded. My eyes felt heavy. Maybe that was good because everything around me was too bright. I felt like I was drifting away into sleep. The world turned into vague feelings and distant sounds. People were talking to me, asking questions. I tried to wave them off and tell them to leave me alone, but they didn't seem to hear me. I felt movement, cold air, flashes of light, constant beeping, and voices all around. My body felt poked and prodded. Just let me be, I managed to say softly. I wanted them to stop bothering me and let me slip away in peace. He's aware, someone shouted. Then closer to me, I heard, Sir, can you tell me your name? Do you know where you are? Their questions were frustrating. I again weakly tried to wave them away and let myself drift further off. More shouting, something about my blood pressure. We're losing him. 
It's okay, I mumbled. I had almost completely escaped the pain. It's okay. I lost myself a long time ago. I didn't think they heard me. I wondered if anyone would care enough to give me a gravestone. My last wish was that it would be simple and small, placed somewhere people would always notice it, and then it was over. But she always says things like that, someone was saying with a hint of annoyance. I mean, that's just Sarah, right? I've told you about her before. I wanted to agree. I didn't know why or who Sarah was, but somehow it all seemed to make sense. I felt like I was part of a conversation but had forgotten what we were discussing earlier. Anyway, the voice continued in a friendly tone. Eddie, the bouncer, has to escort this poor guy out even though he really likes him. Not that Eddie would ever say that out loud because he's really shy, which is kind of endearing. But he has a responsibility, right? And the guy's date is still having a tough time in the bathroom. That part puzzled me. I thought Eddie liked Sarah, so this was all new information. If only I could remember who Eddie and Sarah were. With some effort, I opened my eyes. The ceiling above me looked different from the one I had seen earlier. This one appeared clean. Other sounds started to register in my mind. People walking down a hallway, some beeping, a raspy breathing noise, and a woman speaking over a loudspeaker. It felt like a place I should recognize, but I couldn't recall what it was. The person talking was close to me. I could feel the warmth of a hand holding mine. I wanted to turn my head to say something, but my neck wouldn't let me move. A tightness in my throat kept me from doing anything other than making a soft sound. I gradually forced my eyes to look to the left, trying to see what was around me. It was tiring. I never thought it would take so much energy just to look around. Confusion set in as I realized I was in a hospital room. And there was a clown holding my hand. She was a pretty clown, really. She didn't look like the usual kind with a fake nose and wild wig. Underneath the white makeup, she looked to be in her late twenties or early thirties. Colorful swirls decorated her cheeks. The tip of her small nose was painted bright red to match her lips, and her hair was a flow of shiny purple curls that framed her shoulders. It looked too smooth to be a wig. She wore a white lab coat, but beneath it was a dress that looked like a rainbow of colors. I couldn't see much below her waist, but I guessed she wore big red shoes to complete her look. She kept talking as I took in her appearance. I lost track of what she was saying as I focused on her. I began to feel sleepy again. My eyelids were heavy and my whole body felt numb. But I didn't want to sleep. It felt like I had already been asleep for ages. I just wanted to lie there, watch her, listen to her, and feel her gloved hand in mine a little longer. I didn't understand why there was a clown in the hospital. I couldn't remember why I was there in the first place. But I was glad she was with me, whoever she was. I tried to speak again, but only a small sound came out. I felt something uncomfortable in my mouth and throat. I tried to make a louder sound to get her attention and squeezed her hand to let her know I was there. My fingers hardly moved. It probably felt like a gentle breeze through her gloves. I didn't know if she noticed me or felt the slight change, but then she gasped. Her eyes, shining and bright as emeralds, widened in surprise, and her lips formed a cute little O. Oh. She looked at me with a joy I hadn't seen in a long time. You're awake. Oh my goodness, you're awake. How long have you been? She stopped to act quickly. Hold on, let me get the nurse. Can you stay awake? Please try to stay awake. She reached for a small white piece of plastic near the bed and pressed it repeatedly. I could hear a ringing sound in the hallway. Her other hand still held mine tightly. It's going to be all right, she said with a bright smile. Just stay awake. I would have nodded if I could. Instead, I blinked slowly and tried to squeeze her hand back. Her smile grew wider. Then, people in white lab coats and nurse uniforms filled the room, guiding the girl away and checking the machines. A man in blue scrubs leaned over me with a serious look. Sir, can you hear me? Blink twice if you can. It felt hard to move my eyelids, but I managed to blink slowly. He smiled back at me. Good. Now, you might be feeling confused, and that's okay. His words would have made more sense if I understood why it was okay. I'm Dr. Gorofsky. You're in the hospital and have been for a while. Your body is weak right now. There's a tube to help you breathe, so don't try to talk. It won't work. It might feel frustrating, but please try to relax. He shook his head, looking impressed. You have no idea how lucky you are.
I felt the tubes connected to me but hadn't realized it until then. I felt something in my nose, mouth, and throat. My right arm felt heavy with more tubes connected to it. I couldn't move or speak and my body felt strange. How could this be considered lucky? Stay strong. I know you probably have many questions and will help you find the answers. Just be patient. It will take some time. My mind was foggy, and I wanted to ask him if he really thought I could go anywhere. I blinked twice to show I understood, and he nodded sharply back at me. The world around me felt uncertain. I was aware of what was going on around me, but I didn't really feel like I was there. The medical team was asking me questions and checking on me, but I couldn't understand much of it. Sometimes I'd look at the door to see if the girl would come back. She didn't, but searching for her helped me pass the time. Thinking about her kept my mind busy, too. Lying in bed, I wondered who she was and why she had been there. I'd heard stories about entertainers visiting kids in the hospital, and I imagined superheroes might show up, too. I thought maybe Spider-Man or Wonder Woman would come next. But knowing my luck, it would probably be someone silly like Deadpool. After all, I wasn't a kid. Nurses and doctors came in and out, like the passing of time that felt blurry to me. I would sleep and wake up, sleep and wake up, and slowly I started to feel restless as I got better. Bits of memory returned to me. I remembered going to the store for milk and then falling, but I couldn't remember being shot. I didn't recall the faces of anyone else around, but I vividly remembered lying on the floor and seeing a sail on Hershey bars and Reese's peanut butter cups near the Kit Kats. Several days later, at least I thought it was several days, the clown girl came back. I was sitting up a bit more in bed and my mind felt clearer than before. They had also taken out the breathing tube, which I was glad I had missed while I was asleep. I still couldn't talk, but I could move a little. Hey, she waved shyly from the doorway, glancing back into the hallway before stepping inside. She wore the same outfit as before, but this time her big red shoes were actually high heels, looking like stilts. It suddenly made me realize she was shorter than I initially thought. But then again, everyone seems taller when you're lying down. She carefully sat in the chair next to me and took my hand again. I felt a bit stronger now. I could grip her fingers lightly and manage a small smile. Turning my head to look at her was hard, but I did my best. I'm really not supposed to be here, she said, but I wanted to check on you. She rolled her big green eyes. I always found big eyes charming. While you were sleeping, they called it therapy. Now that you're awake, they say it's getting in the way. Nurses are something else, right? She reached over to brush a stray piece of hair from my forehead. It was a kind gesture that felt special. She seemed eager to keep the conversation going, so I let her do the talking. It felt nice to listen to her. Her voice was bright and cheerful. So I don't know if you remember me, but I'm Cotton. She smiled and bit her lip. Her makeup looked great. It didn't even smear. Do you recall that? I must have talked to you for hours in the past couple of weeks. I have no idea what you really heard. I thought if I just kept talking, you might notice me. Cotton laughed and shook her head playfully. Silly me, I know. I'm a better entertainer than a serious listener, but I had to give it a shot. I felt a bit of discomfort as I swallowed. I couldn't speak or write, but I managed to move my hand in hers until my finger touched the soft fabric of her glove. I needed to know something and there was only one way to ask. With great effort, I traced a single letter in her palm. He for a moment, Cotton looked surprised, realizing how much work that took. She was quick to understand my question. She smiled gently, though there was a hint of sadness in her eyes and held my hand in hers again, because there wasn't anyone else here for you. And that's how I met Cotton. Or rather, that's how I met Cindy. Cotton was both her last name and her clown name. At first, she wanted to be called Cottontail the Clown because she thought it sounded fun, but she wasn't really a fan of rabbits. Cindy told me she found out about me while visiting children in the hospital. Out of curiosity, she came to check on me. She felt sad that no one was visiting me, so she started spending time with me. It was a bit heartbreaking to learn that no one came to see me, not even my sister, but it made me appreciate Cindy even more. She had a kind heart. I discovered there was a reason my sister hadn't been contacted. No one knew who I was. Some people had gone through my belongings after I went down and took my wallet. I arrived at the hospital without any ID, which explained why I was still alive, 
and no one to identify me. They figured out I was a local, but beyond that, I was officially a John Doe. Even worse, until I could communicate, I remained a mystery patient. It took a week after I woke up before I could finally tell them my name. When they asked if I had any family, I said no. I had left my sister behind, and I didn't want to bring her back into my troubled life. But deep down, I didn't feel like that person anymore. I didn't feel like someone who had shut himself off from the world, angry at everyone and everything. That felt like a distant nightmare. But if I wasn't that person anymore, then who was I? Eventually, I learned more about my situation through Cindy and Dr. Gorowski. I had been hurt badly, with three injuries, one in my left leg, one in my belly, and one near my right lung. Now, I had a new knee that doctors said would last for 80 years. Cindy joked that I should get a refund for it. The second injury had damaged my diaphragm and moved up into my stomach, hurting some of my liver. The third shot hit to the right of my heart, affecting my lung, too. When I fell, I also hurt my head pretty badly, but thankfully my brain was okay. Still, the bump made it hard for the doctors to care for me. There was also the issue of not eating well. It seemed strange, but my poor diet and lack of sleep bothered the doctors. I wondered if they thought my mind was not quite right. Overall, I had spent a long time in surgery, about 93 hours, and I was in a coma for six weeks. I had flatlined twice, once in the emergency room and once during surgery. It would take a few more weeks before I could leave the hospital since I needed a lot of therapy to recover. The truth was, I had nowhere to go. I didn't have any insurance and no money to pay for the hospital bills or the help I needed. The thieves had taken everything from my bank account and my home, leaving me with nothing. Even if the police caught them, I was told by a detective that it was unlikely I would see any of my things again. I shared my worries with Cindy through a touchpad. She just smiled and said, You can't do anything about it now. Just focus on getting better. Then she would tell me stories from her other jobs, her voice warm and reassuring, creating an atmosphere of comfort in the sterile hospital room. This is how she spent her time with me, and she enjoyed doing it. Cindy was really good at telling stories. It wasn't so much about the stories themselves, but how she told them that kept me listening. The nurses tried to keep Cindy from visiting, but I insisted she stay. I told them she was the only person who had been there for me, and I wanted her by my side as much as possible. They mentioned her needing to be with children, but since she was a volunteer and only visited me at specific times, it wasn't really an issue. Cindy helped me a lot. She knew a lot about hospitals and had friends who were social workers. Over time, we formed a close bond. She was always there during my therapy sessions and spent most of her free time with me. She usually wore her clown costume, and sometimes I found myself curious about what she looked like without it. Once I was able to speak again, my voice sounding different, I shared my life story with her. All of it. We talked late at night about many things. She was good at getting me to share my thoughts. I opened up to her in ways I hadn't with anyone else. I even told her about how I had been with Gwen one last time after our divorce, a decision I found hard to regret completely. It was odd, but I didn't feel much anger toward Gwen and Joe anymore. Maybe it was because time had made things easier for me. Or maybe it felt like I had changed into a new person. I could discuss it with Cindy as if it had happened to someone else, like a friend. I still felt the pain, but I was a step away from it now. Cindy also shared her past without hesitation. She had dropped out of high school, gotten into some trouble, and had left home. At 18, she experienced a difficult loss without ever knowing who the father was. Then she worked hard to turn her life around, got her GED, and started to support herself. Those were her words, not mine. One of her first jobs was performing for children, which led her to clowning. She also waitressed and worked as a bartender. She earned a lot doing what she did and still enjoyed clowning for charity. You don't mind that I used to dance or that I work online? She asked me one day. Some people can be uncomfortable with that. Do you perform as a clown? That made her laugh and I chuckled along. Smiling felt better and I found myself doing it more often. No, I could probably do it, but it doesn't feel right. I have so many other costumes. Cindy tilted her head, her purple curls moving playfully. But you're truly okay with it? Definitely, I said honestly. If you enjoy it, then go for it. Life, life is too short. I do enjoy it, but lots of guys have issues with it or make silly assumptions. My last boyfriend, Keith, 
wanted me to introduce him to my co-workers for a group outing. Cindy paused, giving my words some thought. Would you date someone like me, a dancer or someone who shares herself online? Would you be okay with that? I took a moment before answering, letting the question sink in. I wouldn't have a problem with it as long as she was honest about it. I bit my lip, considering it further. I might struggle with watching her perform, to be honest. That could be hard. But if I trusted her and she was clear about it and it was just that, yeah, I think I could handle it. Where had my worries gone? Maybe I was a different person. Why do you ask? No reason, really, she replied easily. I was just thinking about why I don't have a boyfriend right now. The topic faded away, and I didn't think much about it afterwards. Looking back, I realized I wasn't very smart. I remember asking her if she might get in trouble for spending so much time with a patient. There were rules about doctors and therapists getting close to those they care for, weren't there? Cindy just shrugged and said, I'm not a licensed therapist, just a licensed clown. Finally, the day came for me to leave the hospital. I had spent months there. I still needed more therapy, but they couldn't keep me forever. I had no idea where I would stay since my landlord had evicted me and I couldn't do anything about it. My car had been towed and I didn't have any money to get it back. I worried about all this for the week before I left, but Cindy kept saying she had it all taken care of and not to worry. When I asked her about the bill, she just smiled. On the day I was discharged, I had the biggest surprise since Gwen and Joe. It was the first time I saw Cindy in regular clothes without her clown makeup. Her hair was still a bright purple, but her smile was even more beautiful without the face paint. She beamed widely as they wheeled me to the exit. She twirled gracefully, showing off her long legs, then bowed dramatically and laughed. Her outfit was much more fitted than her clown costume, a sweater dress that complemented her shape, and I could see why she was good at her job. Nice legs and a confident presence aside, I found myself captivated by her eyes. They sparkled with fun and mischief. Later, I learned that her eyes were really that unique color. Her hair might have been dyed, but she didn't have any color contacts in to match that bright green. Looking into her eyes at that moment made me realize I had feelings for her. I just wasn't sure if I could trust those feelings yet. So, where are you taking me? I asked as she helped me into her car. A halfway house or something? Oh no, nothing like that. Don't worry, you'll like it. Cindy glanced at me with a playful smirk. What, you don't trust me? I smiled slightly. I was feeling good overall. My body still ached, and any effort made me tired, but I felt better than I had in a long time. I wondered if the fall had somehow cleared away some darkness inside me. There was still a shadow deep within, but it felt smaller in the light of a new beginning. I trust you. It's hard, but I trust you. I let out a breath. At least I don't have to worry about my luggage getting lost, I joked. We pulled into the driveway of an old house from the early 20th century. The neighbors upstairs are nice, Cindy said as she helped me up the porch steps. I was still getting used to walking with a cane. Judy works at the County Historical Society, and her husband James owns a small repair shop. Their kids visit sometimes. They're great. They have fun barbecues. She led me to the door on the right and fiddled with a set of keys. But your roommate? You might want to be careful with her. Roommate? Yeah, she said with a sigh. We stepped inside a cozy living room filled with mismatched furniture. The space felt lived in but tidy, showing a regular effort to keep it clean. A light scent of incense drifted in the air. She can be really difficult sometimes. When she wants something, she just goes for it. No thinking, just racing ahead. Is she that bad? I asked, still trying to understand. Oh, you wouldn't believe some of the things she does. She can be so clueless. Cindy closed the door behind us. Like, she might meet someone she just met a couple of months ago, and if he's having a tough time, she'll just bring him home. No warning. Can you believe that? I picked up on her meaning. Wait, you mean... Cindy came close and wrapped her arms around me gently. I felt her resting her head on my shoulder, her warmth against my back. Did you really mean it the other day when you said you were okay with what I do? Yeah, as long as it makes you happy. She stepped in front of me, her face brightening with excitement. Yes, she said with joy, standing on her tiptoes. I learned that no one gives hugs like Cindy. Five years went by and things improved. I noticed a big difference between Cindy and my ex-wife, Gwen. 
Gwen was quiet and somewhat passive. She had a dark style that never changed much. She wore simple clothes that didn't attract much attention. Looking back, she seemed to let life just happen. Cindy was full of energy. She was still small, but where Gwen was thin, Cindy had softness and curves. Her clothes were bright and varied, often mismatched, which made her smile. Gwen let life happen to her. Cindy? Cindy embraced life with laughter. Of course, we had our challenges too, just like any couple. My struggle with sadness didn't just disappear, though getting shot and recovering was a big deal. You could say it changed the way I thought. I didn't really have any serious issues afterward, just some bad dreams sometimes. And a few loud doorbells would make me a bit anxious, but I managed. Cindy, on the other hand, was quite the free spirit. Sometimes her adventurous nature would make me annoyed one day, and then I'd find myself appreciating her all over again the next. I still had a lot of medical bills hanging over me. Luckily, thanks to Cindy's help, I managed to reduce them a bit. The county covered some, charities took care of more, and after that it was just a matter of paying them little by little. I might never be free of it. The total was in the hundreds of thousands. It was possible I'd still owe money even at the end of my life. Cindy wouldn't let me feel bad about it. The sky is always there, she told me, and sometimes things can fall on you when you least expect it. But that hasn't happened. It's the same with debt. It can be there for people like us, but we can't let it stop us from living. Cindy had a lot of sayings like that that kept me going. She also had her ways to keep our relationship strong. We never went to bed upset. Sometimes we stayed up all night just talking, but we always went to sleep together. If either of us got really upset, we'd talk it out right away. She said it was a rule in our house. Plus, we always set aside one night a week just for us. No family or friends. That was very important to her and she had many friends. Friends who had been through tough times and understood our situation. My new circle was full of people who were not living the typical American dream. Nobody owned a home, few had their own cars, and everyone faced their own challenges. These friends quickly became mine too, especially when they learned I played tabletop games. I was a bit behind in my D&D &D knowledge, but it didn't take long for me to join in again. Having adventures with a group of interesting characters late into the night was a unique experience. Thanks to these friends, I found some work. It didn't pay as well as Cindy's, but it helped us get by. I did part-time jobs at our neighbor's repair shop, worked at a local bookstore, and helped out at some nightclubs as a bartender, waiter, or driver. I earned a good reputation as someone reliable who could jump in when needed. True to my word, I didn't mind Cindy's job at all. Watching from the sidelines had its own fun, and I couldn't help but smile a bit. Seeing her shine at the club was a challenge, but I tried to focus on the positive aspects. She engaged with the audience, showcasing her talent without crossing any boundaries. It was a classy venue where professionalism was paramount, and her boss emphasized that everyone had to respect the rules. My partner was a wonderful dancer. She might not have been the best there, but she knew how to move. Even more impressive was how she could charm drinks and extra tips from the customers, winning them over with her warmth and friendliness. We would laugh on the way home while she counted her money, enjoying our time together. Things were better for me, but I never said we were perfect. I had learned a lot since the days when I let myself get hurt. I started going to therapy, and Cindy often came with me. We mostly attended group sessions at the local university because I couldn't afford a private therapist. I also joined different community support groups, and I began to work on feeling better and dealing with my sadness. I learned some important things, especially about my divorce and what had happened afterward. The truth is, I let myself become unhappy because I was punishing myself. Deep down, I was hurt that I had hurt the woman I loved, even if she had made mistakes too. I didn't believe I deserved love or friendship, so I isolated myself because I thought I didn't deserve to be happy. Sometimes the mind can be really tough. Part of getting better was reconnecting with my sister. It was hard for me. Cindy had to call her for me. When I said, hey, um, it's Jack, Annabelle was very angry. I stayed quiet while she expressed her feelings until Cindy took the phone. Hey, Annabelle, this is Cindy. Who? Oh, your brother's been around with me. Just a heads up, he's been through a lot lately and needs some support. I was stunned. Long story short, your brother had some serious health issues. I know he's made mistakes, but raising your voice won't really help. Cindy smiled at me. What you should really do is see him in person. 
So when can you come visit? It was a heartfelt reunion. In short, after 14 years of struggle, I finally began to turn my life around. It took a lot. Dying, a lot of talking, hard work, five years, and a younger woman who wore noisy shoes to finally feel happy at the age of 52. I wasn't rich, and I might leave this world without money, but for the first time since my divorce, I felt calm. But life had one more surprise in store for me. It was May, and I was enjoying the small porch behind the house. It was a special day for Cindy and me. We both had the day off and decided to relax together. The air was cool, the grass was bright green, and the sky was a beautiful blue. It was perfect weather for sitting in a lawn chair with a cup of tea. I had brought a book about a game we were going to play next week, but I hadn't opened it yet. I wanted to enjoy being outside. After about half an hour, Cindy came out to join me. She had worked late the night before and had just woken up. I smiled when I saw her. Hey, how did you sleep? I asked. She made a soft noise and sat down in the chair next to me. She took my hand and gently stroked it with her fingers. It was usual for her to be quiet in the morning, so we sat there holding hands as birds chirped and cars moved in the distance. It felt like it was going to be a good day. Jack, she finally said without looking at me. Did you talk to Annabelle last night? Yeah. We talked about small things like the kids. Why? Cindy nodded, her beautiful curls bouncing. Did she mention anything else? I thought for a moment. Remembering things was sometimes tricky for me, but I usually did well with my sister and her family. Not really. We didn't talk long. Then a thought hit me. Oh, she did say she got the results from that DNA test she took a few months ago. She's been very interested in family history lately. I'm not sure what she hopes to find. I think it's for the kids, Cindy said quietly. She and Duncan want them to understand their roots. I chuckled. But they're adults now. Well, except for James, and he's old enough to realize he didn't just appear out of nowhere. Knowing about family can be important, Cindy smiled lightly. Anything else? I wasn't always the quickest to catch on, but her tone made me curious. Cindy usually didn't avoid topics. No, I said slowly, trying to nudge her to share more. Maybe my sister had seemed a little off when we last talked. Should she have? My girlfriend clicked her tongue in annoyance, her lips twisting slightly. Maybe. She asked me to talk to you about it today, but I was hoping she would explain more herself. Cindy bit her upper lip, then sighed. Look, you were saying how she's been busy with her family history stuff, right? Trying to find lost relatives and all that? I wasn't sure where she was going with this. My father had died when he was young, and we had never been close to that side of the family. I understood why Annabelle might be curious. We also had cousins on my mother's side that we hadn't heard from in years. Everyone loves a good mystery. There are even TV shows about discovering family roots. But Cindy sounded worried. I kept quiet and waved my hand, encouraging her to continue. Another smile crossed her lips as she squeezed my hand, just like when she visited me in the hospital. What if Annabelle found something? Something from your past that you didn't know about? Something about, she took a deep breath, Gwen. Hearing this made me uneasy, and I could feel my jaw tightening. Cindy, I'm trying to put the past behind me. That's what the therapist said. I need to either accept it or let it go. I've struggled to accept it, so I've decided to let it be. If it turns out Gwen is related to me somehow, I'd rather not know. Cindy let out a small sound of frustration. You might not be better off, Jack, but maybe you would be. Annabelle found this out two weeks ago, and she talked to me about it recently. The two of us have been debating whether to tell you, because it is about Gwen, but it also isn't. And we both know how you feel about secrets. We don't want you to discover this in an unexpected way. Is it really that serious? I took a deep breath, thinking. I didn't want to dig up the past, especially regarding my ex-wife. I believed I had made real progress in the past five years, and knowing something new could set me back. But I hated secrets. Both Cindy and Annabelle looked worried about how I'd react if I were caught off guard again. I couldn't imagine what kind of news could surprise me more than when I learned about Gwen's past with Joe. For me, the pain of that betrayal was worse than anything else that had happened. I was still sensitive about the whole thing. As I wrestled with the dilemma, I could only see one path ahead of me. 
I didn't want to go down this path, but seeing the worried look on Cindy's face made it clear that I had no choice. Well, if it's got both of you so concerned, I guess I need to hear it, I said. She bit her lip and nodded, then knelt in front of me, taking my other hand. Gazing up at me, all I could see in her eyes was care and concern. Jack, Annabelle found out that you have a daughter through Gwen, and she wants to meet you. My mind went blank. I couldn't believe what I had just heard. The weight of this news felt too heavy to understand. That's... What was I trying to say? I was overwhelmed by how unbelievable it all seemed. That's not possible. I haven't seen Gwen in twenty years. No, that can't be true. Cindy held my hands tighter and lifted herself slightly to console me. Shh, Jack. I know it sounds strange, but you mentioned that you had one last moment with Gwen the same day your divorce was finalized. Could it really be possible? I was lost for words. A daughter? All this time I had a daughter and didn't know it? I... I don't know. But I couldn't form complete sentences. I was in shock. My quiet afternoon with my lively girlfriend felt like it had just been turned upside down. Twenty years. That meant this girl must be around nineteen. Gwen and I had always wanted children when we were together. Now it seemed I had missed nineteen years of her life. A heavy sadness began to rise within me again. Cindy must have sensed it because she hugged me tightly, trying to keep me grounded. Why didn't Gwen ever tell me? She could have let me know. I don't know, Jack, she whispered, holding me close. I'm sorry. Annabelle and I thought it was best to ask you about this right away. The only way to get answers is to talk to her. Cindy released her hug and sat back on her knees, still holding my hands. Those caring green eyes of hers searched my face for encouragement. Do you want to see her, Jack? Can you talk to her? Nineteen years? What's her name? Cindy smiled, sensing I was starting to open up. Her name is Charity. She's in Vermont, finishing her first year of college. Charity. That was one of the names Gwen and I had planned to use if we had a daughter. Taking a breath, I asked the question weighing on my heart, my voice filled with regret. When can I meet her? Plans were made. Cindy handled everything for me, scheduling a meeting with Charity. Just a day or two after I received the news, I found myself pacing nervously in the living room. I hadn't talked to Charity yet. Through a mutual friend, we both decided to wait until we could meet face to face. I wasn't sure if this was a good idea, but I figured that it wouldn't be fair to judge her without hearing her side of the story. Cindy decided to step out as our meeting time approached. I think you should handle this by yourself, Jack, she said softly. She gave me a gentle smile. I'll be just outside if you need me, okay? Twenty minutes later, the doorbell rang. I felt a knot in my stomach as I stared at the door. After taking a deep breath, I forced myself to turn the doorknob and open it. My heart sank. She looked just like Gwen. She was taller and a bit broader in the shoulders, reminding me of Annabelle. But her wide cheeks, narrow chin, and deep brown eyes were all Gwen. Her hair fell long and smooth down her back, styled with bangs in front, and was brown instead of Gwen's usual black. It was obvious that she was Gwen's daughter, even if she was dressed simply in blue jeans and a maroon college hoodie. One thing stood out even more. It was the antique choker I had given to Gwen years ago, now hanging around Charity's neck. We stood there for a moment, staring at each other, not sure what to say or do. I wondered if she saw anything in me beyond just a tall man with graying hair and a cane. Did I match what she expected? After a few moments of silence, I spoke first. Um. Hi, are you Charity? She nodded, her smile a bit shy. Yes, Charity Eisenberger. I recognize the last name as Joe's. But now that I see you, I wonder if it should be Charity Brandt. Without knowing what to say back, I stepped aside and invited her in. She took a seat on the sofa while I settled into my usual chair nearby. I pointed with my cane toward a small cooler on the floor. Help yourself. There's beer, soda, and water. It's easier to have it close than to make my way to the kitchen. Charity politely declined. She seemed eager to get to the point. You're Jack Brandt, right? I am, I admitted. Which means you're my father. I sighed heavily. That seems to be true according to what my sister told me. She shared the DNA results. Were you looking for me? 
Charity shook her head, and a wave of memories washed over me. She had her mother's way of moving. Not really. I was actually trying to find my grandfather. My mom told me he had treated her badly and then vanished one day. I got a bit fixated on finding him. I wanted to understand why he did what he did. A friend gave me a DNA kit for Christmas, thinking we could find him that way. It seemed like a long shot, but it was cheaper than hiring someone to investigate. Let me guess, I said gently. You found an aunt you didn't know about, someone not related to your mom or dad. Charity nodded slowly, her eyes closed. At first, I didn't know what to think. I had no clue who she was or how she was connected to me. I thought it might be a mistake or just a fluke, but then... The app started showing me other people I didn't recognize, and I found out there was an entire side of my family that was a mystery. My daughter opened her eyes and looked at me with determination. That's when the truth started coming out. I reached out to Annabelle through the app, then by email, and we began talking on the phone. She told me everything, about you and my mom and about Joe. Joe's your father? Charity let out a small laugh. Legally, yes but he never really acted like one. He tried his best, though, and I forgive him for that. But I always made him uneasy. Do you think he knew? That your mom and I? Well, that one last time? I thought about that. I don't think he knew. He always thought I was his. When I brought this up with mom, she broke down and begged me not to tell him. She said it was the one secret she had kept from him. A secret she said was only fair. This made me shake my head in disbelief. Oh, the irony of that, I said, tilting my head to look at her closely. If Joe had gotten Gwen pregnant, their plan was to say it was mine. Irony indeed. Your mom told you what led to our divorce, right? Charity laughed lightly, glancing around the room to avoid my gaze. Yes, but it took a lot of pushing to get her to share. What she didn't say, your sister told me instead. She then looked down at her shoes, her voice becoming soft. I didn't know you two had been married and divorced. I didn't even know you were in my life at all. Nobody talked about you in front of me. I had no idea that mom had been married to anyone other than my dad. Now that we were talking, I felt surprisingly calm. Your mother was good at keeping secrets, I said gently, pointing to her necklace. Did she give you that choker before or after you learned about me? Her finger touched the metal around her neck. She gave this to me when I was six, although it didn't fit until I was fourteen. I've worn it almost every day since. A shadow crossed her face and her expression became serious. When I asked her about you, she finally told me where it all started. I remember giving her my last gift, I said quietly. She tilted her head, the darkness around us fading a bit. I remember being young and hearing her cry. It usually happened at night, especially when Dad was gone. One time I asked her why, and she said something like, because he's out there alone. I thought she just missed Dad, but now I wonder if it was more. Your mother and I cared for each other deeply, I told Charity gently, but what she wanted was not meant to be. And so you went away. And so I went away. The room filled with silence again. We both wandered through our thoughts until I decided to ask something else. Did your mother ever tell you why she didn't let me know about you? She let out a quick laugh. It took some effort to get it out of her, but yes. Basically, she knew you wanted to move on from that part of your life because it caused you pain. She thought that if you found out about me, you might resent us both. She didn't want you to feel tied to her again. Gwen really did know me well. Maybe she was right, I admitted. I had thought a lot about this in the past days while waiting to see Charity, and her words made sense to me. After your mother, I went through a very tough time. I can't say how I would have reacted back then. I reached out my hand to her, palm up. But now? Now I wish she had told me about you. It's not fair that we missed out on knowing each other. She also said she wanted to hold on to a part of you, something special that you two shared. Charity looked at me with hopeful eyes. You don't dislike me, do you? I almost laughed with relief. Why would I dislike you? I was afraid you might hate me for leaving your mother and you. She smiled, eagerly took my hand and shook her head. I started to feel that way until I learned the whole story. I thought maybe you didn't want me and that's why you left. But now I see it was because of some misunderstandings. To be fair to Gwen, it was not exactly a game. I found myself feeling a bit kinder toward my ex. 
Your mother believed that ignoring a problem was the best way to handle it. She didn't want to tell me about what was happening, so she said nothing. She didn't want you to know about me, so she kept quiet. I can't say I'll ever fully forgive her for that, but I can understand her reasons. I squeezed my daughter's hand gently. But none of that is about you. I wish you had been my father while I was growing up. You seem so much better at talking about feelings than Dad. If it were him, he would have said this wasn't his thing and suggested I talk to Mom instead. Are you talking about Joe? Well, I think he set himself up for this. He once mentioned wanting kids, but also said he would be a bad father. I guess he never gave himself a chance to find out. She paused, thinking about what I said. So, what do we do now? Should I call you Dad? I raised my eyebrows. That might be a bit much for now. It's definitely better than sperm donor, but we still have a lot to learn about each other first. For now, just calling me Jack is fine. Charity nodded, but I could see she looked a bit sad, so I quickly added, Now that we know about each other, we can take some time to really get to know one another, if that's what you want. I know I'd like that. Her face lit up with a smile. So, can I move in? I could tell she was joking, and I laughed, feeling much more relaxed. Well, that depends. Are you planning to bring friends over sometimes? She suddenly looked surprised. No, I mean, that's not a problem. About this friend, I asked. The one who gave you the DNA kit. She's not a boy, is she? No. And maybe she's more than just a friend. Charity pulled her hand back and sank into the couch a bit. Is that, is that a problem? I kept smiling to let her know it was okay. Well, I'm not sure yet. I haven't met her, but I'd really like to. If she's here with you, maybe we could all go out for dinner together. How does that sound? The relief on her face was wonderful. She seemed so excited, like Cindy used to be. Yes, I'll ask her. She's at the motel. We were hoping that if everything went well today, we could find part-time jobs here until school starts at the end of summer. That way, we can all get to know each other. I reached out and held her hand again. I think that's a great way to start. But there's something I need to ask of you, Charity. What is it, Jack? She frowned a little. It feels strange for me to say that. She sat up again. What do you need from me? I hesitated. I wasn't sure what she expected from this reunion, but I had to be clear about something important. Your mother, Gwen. I... I'd rather not know anything about her. I don't want to hear how she's doing or where she is. I don't want to see her or talk to her. I don't want to know anything about her or Joe, and I really don't want them to know anything about me. I don't want them in my life, and I don't want to be in theirs. I only want to focus on you. Charity thought about what I was saying. You still care for her. I do. I probably always will. I will always cherish the Gwen I shared eight beautiful years with. Hearing about your mother now feels like just a sad memory. But you care about Cindy. I do. A lot, in fact. More than I ever did with your mother, even on their best days. But Gwen represents a tough time in my past, Charity, and it's hard to move forward when I keep remembering it. My daughter considered this before nodding with a familiar sadness. I might make a mistake and say something I shouldn't. That's okay, Charity. Mistakes happen. Just try to avoid anything too direct. We talked for a while longer before she started to feel tired. It seemed she and her girlfriend Linda had driven up right after classes. She planned to call back later to confirm dinner plans, and we'd all go out together. Cindy quietly came into the living room and sat where Charity had been, taking my hand as she often did. So, I guess it went well? She asked carefully. I nodded, squeezing her hand gently. We were always close. It went well. We're making dinner plans for tonight before you head to work. I overheard a bit of what you said, Cindy added playfully. What was that about loving me more than Gwen, even on the best days? I laughed and pulled her closer, inviting her to sit down with me. You know it's true. Do I? She said teasingly, leaning back slightly. How are you going to show me? Bagels, I said with confidence. Bagels? Yes, we're going to grab some bagels for lunch. I hope they have those French toast ones. I really like those. Cindy looked puzzled. How do bagels show you love me, Jack? Simple. I gently touched her hand. After the bagels, we're going to the jeweler's. I'm going to buy you a ring and ask you to be mine. 
Oh, well, that's... It was delightful to see her surprised. She melted into my arms, smiling back at me. We had discussed marriage on and off for the past couple of years, and now it felt like the right time to make it real. If that's the case. Cindy shared a gentle smile, one that made me feel warm inside. If that's the case, she whispered, playfully touching my ear, then I guess I should say yes and save you some time. We should practice our honeymoon first, just to ensure everything goes smoothly. I smiled. There was no rush for bagels. The small joys in life would always be there while we focused on the important moments.